Thank you for joining us for this practice update. I'm Dr. Farzana Hafizula. Joining me today is Dr. Santosh Kesari, Chair and Professor of the Department of Translational Neurosciences and Neurotherapeutics at the John Wayne Cancer Institute. Thank you for coming here today. Thank you for inviting me, Farzana. Absolutely. I want to talk about the field of neuro-oncology broadly. Are there any deficits in our treatment landscape? And if we do have certain deficits, how can we fill those gaps? What's happening from your end based on your expertise? Well, as you know, neuro-oncology is a tough field. And um, for decades, we didn't uh, have very good drugs. And although we've tested hundreds of drugs over the years, very few have passed the finish line to get FDA approval, including temozolomide and Avastin. And now we have this new device called Optune, which has shown tremendous results in the past few years. So I think we're making some progress. But clearly, over many decades, with only a few drug approvals, we're way behind all the other cancers that we deal with, lung cancer, breast cancer, renal cell, etc. So I think we need to do better. Um, my personal feeling is one of the reasons that we haven't done a great job is the fact that most of the studies are using drugs that are made for another cancer, whether it's lung, breast, etc. And one of the big problems with brain cancer as opposed to other cancers is the fact that we have to deal with this thing called the blood-brain barrier. Yes. And many of the drugs are not made to get into the brain because they are taken out early on in the drug development pipeline because companies don't want to see neurological side effects. That would normally sure. kill a drug. Mm. So, so in brain tumors, that's what we've been doing. We've been using drugs that were never meant to go into the brain, and we're surprised that they failed. Yes. That's one of the real deficits we have in the field is drugs that get into the brain. And now companies have understood this recently, especially with lung cancer and breast cancer brain metastasis. There are compounds, EGFR inhibitors, ALK inhibitors, that do have good brain penetrations that are showing some activity. In glioblastoma, though, it's a different cancer, different molecular profile, different signaling pathways. And we really haven't gotten our hands around what are the best targets and making uh, drugs that get into the brain very well. I focused on this in my lab for, for 15 years now. Sure. And one of the things that we've understood is that you need to make drugs that, to, to targets that specifically drive glioblastoma. And one of the targets that we focused on um, since my postdoc days at Dana-Farber is a protein called OLIC2. And this is a very important transcription factor that's important during brain development, but also is required for glioblastoma formation by various uh, models that have uh, been studied over the years. So what we decided to focus on, um, normally uh, transcription factors are very difficult to target, to find drugs that would disrupt dimerization. But with the use of uh, computational biology, computational chemistry, you can actually use computer science to model proteins and find compounds in silico that would disrupt protein-protein interactions. And we did this, and we discovered compounds that uh, disrupt OLIC2 dimerization and inhibit glioblastoma cell growth in, in, in the lab. And we filed patents on this, and, and now they're a part of a company called Cortana, which is yes. now developing for clinical trials in the future. Excellent. So that's very fascinating, very exciting. Um, and is this something that's being done outside of the realm of all oncology? Is this sort of... Um, unique to the neuro-oncology field? So I think for neuro-oncology, we have to start from an understanding of the targets for glioblastoma, the critical nodes, rather than just simply going after the targets that seem to work for other cancers. EGFR is a very important target for many cancers, and it's certainly important for glioblastoma. And we made some progress, but still no drug that really yes. is as approved yet. But I think one of the things that it's, we've understood is that because of the heterogeneity of tumors, not every tumor has an EGFR mutation that's targetable. And so when you look inside a cell, most cancers, the network of signaling that occurs at the surface level, whether it's EGFR, PDGFR, MET, ALK, et cetera, they converge into certain pathways, and in particular into certain sets of transcription factors which was actually presented at one of the talks uh, today at the SNOW meeting, that, that these critical transcription factors may be better targets. 
and maybe more broadly applicable across all subtypes of glioblastomas. And OLIC2 is a, one transcription factor that is present in all, all glioblastomas, all subtypes of glioblastomas. So it's an important target to think about. So though there's commonality in that target, you did mention the heterogeneity that is inherent in glioblastoma. How can we marry those two concepts essentially to create, to look at that common target, but also recognize that heterogeneity is present and that the tumor heterogeneity probably, you know, um, gets more diverse really over time as treatment options are added to the plate? Absolutely. I think this is one of the critical things. Although we're focusing on a target that we think helps all glioblastoma, you have to understand that there is heterogeneity at other nodes and that when we do clinical trials, you have to be uh, wary of that so that you can uh, understand why some patients respond and others don't. And there may be a link back to the other known biomarkers that we think about on a regular basis. But it also highlights the fact that certainly no matter what you think about the drug or target, it's going to end up being that you need to do combination therapies at the end of the day. And when we look at numerous cases of other cancers, whether it's in vitro and animal models or in patients, we've seen how tumors evolve in real time within days or weeks of treatment. You can actually document whether it's EGFR expression changes or the secondary effects coming up, such as an activation of another signaling pathway in the presence of um, a, a one pathway inhibitor. So how do you recommend we stay abreast of those changes to be very astute, diligent, and almost have a very intuitive approach to treating a patient? Yeah, one of the problems we have as opposed to other cancers is that we can't have easy, we don't have easy access to tumor tissues sure. uh, in real time. Uh, although there are methods such as circulating tumor DNA or molecular imaging that's increasingly being used to help us document what happens in short periods of time. And I think some of those technologies are getting better and better so that we can actually monitor disease over time and see what changes happen as we're treating patients. You mentioned molecular imaging. Would that have a role now in clinical trials that are currently ongoing or maybe being designed? Absolutely. You know, one of the problems we have, especially in the recurrent glioblastoma setting, is that after radiation, we have a hard time telling whether it's tumor or, or necrosis or a mix of tumor and necrosis. And this is one of the things that contributes noise to all of our clinical trials. Sure. And so I think we need better molecular imaging. If, if we have better tools that tell us which patients, it, it, the, the growth that we see is really tumor growth as opposed to radiation necrosis, we would have better uh, trial patients uh, and know better whether yes. the tumors are responding or not. Excellent points, and I want to thank you very much for sharing your perspective and your expertise today with us. Thank you. We're looking forward to seeing more from you. Thank you. Absolutely. For this practice update, I'm Dr. Farzana Hafizullah. Join us again soon.